chapter 36, GI disorders. So in this chapter, we'll talk about hemorrhage of our uh, GI tract. Um, we'll discuss peptic ulcer disease, irritable bowel syndrome, and then GI bleeding. So what's the job of the bowel? So the job of the bowel is to digest food. So that will involve corrosive solutions and potentially pathogenic bacteria as well, because we know we have a lot of bacteria in our um, GI tract. The bowel's job is also to absorb the food into the blood while keeping the corrosive substances and the bacteria inside the gut. So it has to be really careful um, in transporting just the food, uh, the nutrients, the water. It also has to keep everything moving. So it has to keep it moving at a, at a proper rate so that digestion can occur and we can still absorb everything and it's not moving too quickly where we don't absorb enough or it's not moving too slowly where we become constipated. So inflammation and damage to the bowel wall can lead to hemorrhage. And when you hemorrhage, obviously that will lead to anemia. These should have little arrows. I'm not sure why they went away, but hemorrhage can lead to anemia. Obviously when you're losing whole blood, we said that's one of the reasons why you have um, more loss of red blood cells than normal. So you'll become anemic. We can also see perforations or holes in the wall of your GI tract leading to peritonitis, which is inflammation of the abdominal wall. And then we'll see decreased mucosal function. So the mucosal uh, membrane is where we do the absorption. And so if we have decreased mucosal function, we'll, we're going to see malabsorption. And then we'll also probably see decreased bacterial containment. So we're not going to be able to keep that bacteria in the GI tract because we're damaging the bowel wall. And so that will lead to sepsis. And we talked about septic shock um, previously. So when we do bleed or hemorrhage, it will lead to um, signs and symptoms. And what we see will depend on where we're bleeding and how much we're bleeding. So <clears throat> if you have hemorrhage above the stomach, then it leads to frank um, hematemesis, which is where you vomit up blood and you'll see fresh red blood. And so when you vomit up blood that looks like red blood, um, it lets you know that the bleeding is happening above the stomach. If you bleed into the stomach, then it's going to be partially digested blood. And so when you vomit that up, it'll look like coffee grounds. So it'll be kind of dark and little kind of, you know, ground up coffee bits. Um, if you hemorrhage in the intestines um, with blood, again, mixing into the stools then, then it leads to occult blood, which is blood in the stool. And if you hemorrhage into the intestines with a large volume of blood, where you have a lot of blood, um, it's going to show up as black feces. And then if you hemorrhage in the rectum, then it'll look like red coated, um, red blood coated stools because it's kind of happening right when it's leaving the body. So you can see how, depending on what we see and which way it's coming out. So if we're vomiting, it's going to be bleeding from the stomach or above. And then if it's coming out, um, in our feces, and it's obviously in the intestines and below. So one thing that can lead to bleeding includes peptic ulcer disease. So peptic ulcers are lesions in the mucosal membrane. It can extend below the epithelium, and you can see that um, lesion here. It can develop in the lower part of the esophagus, in the stomach, in the pylorus, the duodenum, or even the jejunum. Um, and it's most common in men between the ages of 20 and 50, and it can be exacerbated by alcohol or tobacco smoking. So one of the major causes of um, ulcers is H. pylori. Um, H. pylori will um, damage the lining of our stomach, and when we damage it, thankfully we can repair um, and heal, but as this process continues, um, things can kind of go wrong or there's an increased risk of it going wrong during this healing process. And so this constant damage and healing can increase the risk of gastric cancer. But if you can't heal, then it can obviously lead to ulcers. And you can see the erosion kind of going deeper and deeper. So H. pylori, again, is the major cause of peptic ulcers, and it's passed from person to person through saliva. 
Um, it's a bacteria, but it's really well adapted to survive in the very acidic environment of our stomach. So our stomach secretes hydrochloric acid, which is very acidic, and it helps actually protect our body um, by destroying pathogens that comes in. But H. pylori has figured out a way to survive in that environment. And what it does is it releases a toxin that destroys the gastric and duodenomucosa, making it more vulnerable to getting um, eroded. And um, as a result, uh, there's less resistance, and so the acids will basically digest our stomach wall, depending on, again, if it's in the stomach or the lower part of the esophagus or the uh, first parts of the small intestine. Now, NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, actually contribute to peptic ulcers uh, by inhibiting the secretion of prostaglandins, and prostaglandins will actually block ulcers. Now, there are some predisposing factors to getting peptic ulcer disease, and one interesting thing is your blood type. So if you're a blood type A, you tend to get gastric ulcers, which would be in the stomach. If you're blood type O, you tend to get duodenal ulcers in the, du du uh, in the duodenum. Um, H. pylori, again, is a predisposing factor because it is one of the major causes. And remember, this is passed from uh, person to person through saliva. And exposure to irritants like alcohol, coffee, tobacco smoke, um, uh, spicy foods. They all contribute to accelerated gastric emptying. Um, and so we have just acids, for example, really contributing to the breakdown of um, our GI tract wall. Emotional stress can also predispose you to getting ulcers because of the increased stimulation of acids. And um, again, our mucosal wall can't really defend itself from all of that. Physical trauma can also cause it, normal aging, your genes. And then we talked about how NSAIDs um, decrease prostaglandins, which increases um, ulcers. So how do we treat it? If H. pylori is the major cause, then let's get, a, get rid of that H. pylori with antibiotics and then try to avoid these predisposing factors. Now I want to talk about irritable bowel syndrome. So IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, um, <clears throat> is where you have um, a constipation and diarrhea, um, where your bowels just really aren't working normally. So normally our uh, GI tract uh, will contract. It does two major types of contractions called segmental and paracelsis. So segmental contractions are where you're basically contracting different segments of your GI tract wall at a time. And what that does is it helps mix the contents inside the GI tract wall. The other type of contraction is called peristalsis. And peristalsis is kind of where you contract from one end and you kind of just contract down in a wave-like formation. And that will help propel the contents inside the GI tract to keep things moving. So the, the segmental contractions mixes while paracelsis moves. Um, let's see, motor activity is most propulsive in the proximal and distal portions of the intestine. So that's where you're going to move the quicker and the most. And um, <clears throat> activity in the rest of the intestines is a little bit slower, and that's really going to allow the digestion of the foods that we eat, and the absorption of the nutrients and absorption of the water. So in IBS, the autonomic nervous system, which we know um, innervates our GI tract, um, it doesn't cause the alternating contractions and relaxations like normal. So normally we'll contract and relax and uh, mix the contents and move the contents um, at a rate that allows us to digest and absorb appropriately. But with IBS, that really just isn't happening. Now, you'll have chronic IBS if it lasts more than three months. Um, and IBS can result in abdominal pain, and you'll see fluctuations in stool frequency and consistency, alternating again between co being constipated and having diarrhea. You'll have excessive gas, and you can have a sense of incomplete evacuation. Again, that's where the constipation comes in. You'll have abdominal distension, nausea, bloating, and mucus in the stool. So what exactly is happening in constipation? So when you're constipated, you're having basically a spasm in your GI tract wall. So your smooth muscles cover your GI tract wall. They're contracting. 
and creating essentially a partial obstruction, trapping things like your stool as well as gas. So that causes the distension, the bloating, the gas pain. <clears throat> then we have diarrhea. And in diarrhea, everything's moving too quickly. And so things are getting, the contents are being propelled too quickly. <clears throat> and so um, you don't have time, for example, to absorb the water like you should. And so that's why you have diarrhea. And um, eating can cause this uh, cholinergic stimulation because um, this is going to, you know, when you eat, you're basically turning on your GI tract. And so that's going to propel things and get things contracted and moving. So it doesn't mean just because you eat, you have diarrhea. But the idea is that you're turning on your GI tract and it may um, just be happening too much. So what can cause it? Um, hormonal changes can. So look at your menstrual cycle. Um, and then ingestion of irritants like coffee, raw food, and vegetables can cause it as well. Um, people who are lactose intolerant, so lactose intolerance can lead to it. If you abuse laxatives and then psychological stress like anxiety and depression um, are also causing it. So treatment, give antidiarrheal agents if you have diarrhea, give antispasmodic agents if you have constipation, and then try to increase fiber in your diet that um, can also be beneficial. So we're going to end with uh, GI bleeding. <clears throat> and we can bleed from the upper part of the GI tract as well as the lower. So the upper GI bleeding is where you're going to bleed um, either in the esophagus, the stomach, or the upper part of the small intestine, so the duodenum. And bleeding can occur because you ingested uh, caustic poisons or you have stomach cancer. And most often it's caused by either peptic ulcer, gastritis, esophageal varices, or Malaroy Weiss tears. So we already talked about peptic ulcer disease and how we're going to erode our GI tract wall um, due to the acids breaking down the GI tract wall because it's lost kind of its uh, ability to protect itself. And so obviously when you eat up your GI tract wall, you're going to bleed. Um, other contributing factors include, and this is all a review, NSAIDs, aspirin, um, alcohol, tobacco, and then we talked about how H. pylori is the major cause. Gastritis can also lead to upper GI bleeding. And this is just general inflammation of the stomach wall, and it has an inability to, again, protect itself from the acids, again, resulting in bleeding, and similar um, uh, risk factors. So NSAIDs, steroids, alcohol, burns, and trauma can lead to gastritis. We also have esophageal varices. This is when you have swelling in the veins of the esophagus or stomach. And that usually is a result from liver disease causing uh, portal hypertension. So we have a portal system, the hepatic portal system that connects um, the GI tract to our liver. So the digestive tract to our liver. And that makes sure that the foods that we absorb go to the liver to get kind of filtered and processed um, and cleaned up before it goes to the heart to then be sent to the rest of the body. Um, and so if you have high blood pressure in that portal system, then that can back up and cause liver uh, esophageal varices. Um, it's most commonly a result of alcoholic liver cirrhosis, and it has a high mortality rate. And then we have Malaroy Weiss tears. These are tears in the mucosa or submucosa of the esophagus or the stomach wall, and it's often caused by forceful or prolonged vomiting or um, laughing or coughing or childbirth. So notice, uh, or even seizures. So notice these are things where you're kind of um, going to kind of stretch your GI tract a little too quickly, and that is going to cause little tears to form. <clears throat> and then we have um, lower GI bleeding. So if you can bleed in the upper part of the GI tract, you certain, certainly can bleed in the lower. And we talked about how upper GI bleeding, we vomit that up. Lower GI bleeding, bleeding it comes out in our feces. Um, so it's going to originate in the lower part of the GI tract, like the small and lower part of the small intestine, the large intestine, the rectum, the anus, and common causes include diverticular disease, angiodysplasia, polyps, and then hemorrhoids and anal fissures. So diverticulosis is a common cause of lower GI bleeding, and it's basically where you have small out pockets that form on the large intestine wall. And so this is um, a view of your large intestine. And notice it looks like someone has basically punched holes into the large intestine, so into the GI tract wall. So you can get things stuck here, and you can start to get damage and bleeding here.
angiodysplasia is um, a malformation in the blood vessels in the walls of your GI tract. So uh, if you have malformed blood vessels, obviously that's going to increase the likelihood of bleeding. Um, elderly and people with chronic kidney failure can develop this. Then we have polyps. Polyps are non-cancerous tumors of the GI tract, more uh, common in people older than 40. Now, they're non-cancerous, but they can transform into cancer, and these polyps can lead to bleeding. So, um, whereas the diverticulosis looks like someone punched holes out, in polyps, it looks like someone punched a hole in. So, you have this growth. And then finally, we have hemorrhoids and anal fissures. So hemorrhoids are swellings of veins in and around the rectum, which can bleed, and repeated stretching from uh, and straining as you try to pass stools can cause them to bleed. Anal fissures are basically little tears in the anal wall um, that will lead to bleeding, and forcefully trying to pass, let's say, an, a particularly hard stool can cause these little tears to occur. And... That is it for this chapter. Thank you.